Good day, guys. Our guest today's interview is Olga Borisova. Good day, Olga. Hello. Olga is a researcher, geneticist, biologist, founder of the Metaspace Just DNA Seek project. Olga was our speaker at the Eternity Life Forum, and now we want to talk about her scientific interests, about mitochondrial therapy, and ask our questions. And the first one will be, what are mitochondria and what role do they play in the human body? Yes, hello one more time. It's my pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. Actually, mitochondria are tiny organelles that are present almost in all our cells. And actually, we have plenty of them, like 10% of our mass are mitochondria. So if your weight is 60 kilograms, then 6 kilograms are your mitochondria. And actually, they were bacteria two billion years ago, but then somehow just appeared in our cells, and now we can't imagine our life without them. From school, we know that mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell, which means they allow us to extract energy from the food we eat and convert it to chemical energy, ATP energy, for all of our processes, for smiling, walking, pumping blood, clearing extracellular garbage, etc. But actually, that is not the only function that mitochondria have. They are involved in the immune processes, so they protect our body from the invaders. They participate in steroid hormone synthesis. For example, many of us know that sex hormones are steroid ones, and the first steps of its synthesis occur in mitochondria. They participate in signaling functions in our cells and epigenetic regulation. You may have heard about that genes may, we may hurt our genes more or less regarding to epigenetic regulation. And mitochondria provide specific compounds which turn, tune the function of our genes. And of course, they are one of the key players of the aging process. Thank you. Uh, what causes mitochondria to lose their functions, and is it a matter of age? Yeah, it can be a matter of age. Of course, when we when we are aging, our mitochondria function unfortunately deteriorate. But our lifestyle and chronic diseases also matter. Sedentary lifestyle lead to decrease in mitochondria amount and their functioning. And also obesity and metabolic diseases also affect mitochondria almost in the same extent as aging process. Also, air pollution is so important and we rarely talk about it actually, but some toxins uh, in our air disrupts respiratory chain within mitochondria and that can lead even to diabetes. There were studies like air pollution can cause diabetes through affecting mitochondria function, function. And of course, certain medication can also affect mitochondria function. Antibiotics, antiretroviral therapy. Uh, our microbiome, the uh, bacteria which inhabit our gut, they can also affect our mitochondria in a large extent. They can stimulate mitochondria function and also lead to decreased function as well. And, of course, there are hereditary, hereditary mitochondrial diseases which can affect their function and they appear like in an early age. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, actually, the next one will be the common question, I suppose. Can lifestyle can change prolong mitochondrial function and how important are physical activity and healthy sleep? Yes, and that actually is a good news that our mitochondria are so respons responsive to our lifestyle changes. So actually everything within our hands, we can do a lot to improve our mitochondria function. If I would prioritize, I would say physical activity is the most important and it's the best way to improve mitochondria function. There are a lot of studies actually which type of physical activity, which amount of physical activity we need to improve mitochondria function. But uh, talking in general, like 30 minutes per day is quite enough to improve mitochondria function. And if we talk about whether it have to be aerobic exercises or high intensity training, 
both are good, but aerobic exercises tend to increase the amount of mitochondria because we need kind of a lot of energy, we consume a lot of oxygen, and high intensity training like uh, improves the functions of existing mitochondria without affecting the amount. But anyway, anything we can do with physical activity is good. Uh, the second, of course, is nutrition. And yes, sleep, yes. When we sleep, you know, there is a hormone called melatonin is produced, but it's not just a sleep hormone, as we know. It's actually the most ancient antioxidant. Bacteria do not sleep, but they still have melatonin to be protected from oxidative stress. So uh, when you have enough good sleep, it matters more than if you buy the most advanced and recently discovered antioxidant, because, because melatonin is a natural antioxidant which protects mitochondria. So yes, good sleep is also essential for mitochondria function. Thank you. Um, the next one, how can mitochondria function be diagnosed? Well, yes, it's, a, it's an interesting question and a very important one. And actually, it's a problem of mitochondrial medicine. It's not that easy because we have different tissues and different organs and all they have different mitochondria. For example, mitochondria function in muscles can be disturbed, but preserved like in liver or somehow. Uh, so there are several approaches. Uh, there is functional testing, and it's usually uh, done by sportmen, exercise stress testing, etc. And then you uh, kind of running, running or bicycling, and then you measure how many oxygen you consume and measuring lact lactate, etc. And also there are genetical markers uh, that can give you information regarding amount of mitochondria. So we can measure like mitochondrial DNA amount and nuclear DNA amount. And by comparing that, we can measure whether the amount of mitochondria increased or decreased, etc. And of course, there are biochemical testing. We can measure organic acid, organic acid test. It's quite popular in urine. And um, it can tell us which factors, which vitamins we need to improve mitochondria function, for example which chains in mitochondria biochemical cycles can be disturbed and how can we correct them. Of course, there are some uh, popular blood tests like, like lactate, pyruvate testing, which can tell us whether something is already wrong with mitochondria. But uh, the approach is combinatory. So we always have to combine different markers and they have to be interpreted by um, experts in this field. So if you, uh, if you hear like there is one test for estimating mitochondria function and it's easy and it's cheap and you will get all the information about all mitochondria within your body, probably it's more marketing one because it's a really complicated task. Yeah, it is. That's why you're working on it and having good results. We know about your projects. Thank you. And yes, thank you. The next question is very interesting. How are a person's eating habits related to mitochondria function? <laughs> well, it's uh, such a long question. We can talk about like a whole day, but to make a long story short, uh, our mitos can't deal in the same time with fats and carbs, you know, like the two main uh, nutritional uh, stuff we, got, we get from food are fats and carbs, and we got energy from it. And to get energy, uh, fats and carbs both have to be oxidized within mitochondria, which will then give us ATP for our processes. Uh, and we have inherited our metabolism from our ancestors. And in the days of our ancestors, food was scarce. So, so to survive, our organism learned how to store excess food as body fat. And from that moment, even if the hunt was unsuccessful, for example, and the man did not have dinner, his organism could just break fat to provide cells with energy. Nowadays, we usually eat often and unhealthy and including high calorie proceed foods and sweets, etc. 
but our organism still stores excess food as fat, even if there is no need for it. Uh, and from our meal, like from everything we have eaten, cells first eat glucose from carbs, especially from sweets. And after a meal, our cells are provided with glucose for approximately four, six hours. And just when all glucose runs out, after the six hours after meal, they continue with stored fats. So mitochondria can't deal at the same time with carbs and fats. But when we eat too often, cells always have glucose for their dinner and become lazy to proceed with stored fats. Mm -hmm. And that can lead to health problems. And first of all, uh, fats, which are not oxidized, they ac accumulate, they want to go inside mitochondria and they are standing like in, in a queue, like knocking the door, okay, let us in. And mitochondria can't proceed with such amount of work and it oxidizes fats incompletely. And the compounds from incomplete fat oxidation, they are quite toxic and they lead to lipid toxicity, etc. And when we break this, um, uh, this cue, carbs, fats, it can lead to insulin resistance, diabetes, fatty liver disease, etc. So uh, the best stuff we, we, we can make, uh, it's kind of making breaks from eating all the time. So our mitochondria can deal with carbs first, with glucose, and then go to fats. And in that case, everything going to be fine. The other important thing in our nutrition are, are providing sufficient nutrients for mitochondria. Because mitochondria, they work as a conveyor. They have so many reactions, they uh, are cyclized. So if you don't have some cofactors for kind of this reaction, they just got stuck with their work. So that's the two most important things in our nutrition. Provide like breaks from food, and provide sufficient nutrients for mitochondrial chemical reactions. Thank you. And it's very interesting for the next question. Can intermittent fasting have a positive effect on mitochondrial function? Yes. Well, yes, it can restore our metabolic flexibility. So the ability to switch from carbs oxidation to fats oxidation. And... Uh, it can give our body exactly that time that is needed to switch the metabolism from carbs to fats, actually. Because we do have to have this uh, period of time, like, like not less than 12 uh, hours, to make our mitochondria oxidize fats again. And moreover, intermittent fasting can stimulate mitochondrial dynamics. What is that? It's only on the picture, meters look like small bean-shaped something. But in fact, our cells, mitochondria, fuse with each other and then divide, and they do it actually to provide us with a stable amount of energy. So whether we eat less or more, uh, when they're together, all together within the cell, then they can make more ATP from one molecule of some food, glucose, for example. Uh, but it also has other important meanings. Through this communication, they can find uh, who is the bad sheep between mitochondria, the bad dysfunctional mitochondria, when the uh, end eliminated. And when mitos are separated, uh, they can become dysfunctional and quality control system is disrupted. And that we often see in diabetes, for example. There is always enough food for mitochondria, the sugar level is quite high, and they are segregated. They are separated from each other, they are not communicating to each other. And the quality control system is disrupted and they can go dysfunctional, which can cause all other diseases. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the next question is interesting. Um, we will talk about the metaphagy. Is metaphagy really useful? Or is it a controversial topic to discuss? Metophagy is, uh, is really useful. Metophagy is a quality control system. So, and it's the main problem actually uh, during our aging. Yes, our mitochondria function declined during aging. It's a problem, but 
Actually, our body has the ability of our cells to eliminate dysfunctional mitochondria and replace them with the new ones. And this process of deleting, eliminating dysfunctional mitochondria are called mitophagy. So when uh, our cells see that these mitochondria are not working appropriately, it uh, doesn't give us enough ATP, but instead generating a lot of harmful molecules like reactive oxygen species, this mitochondria is tending to be eliminated through mitophagy process. But the problem is that during aging, we don't know why, but this uh, mitophagy process is uh, declining constantly. So our internal quality control system is not working as good as it has to work. And that's why uh, dysfunctional mitochondria accumulate and that leads to oxidative stress, etc., etc. Uh, there are some ways to increase uh, mitophagy level. Uh, one of them is actually physical training, physical activity. Another one is intermittent fasting, because when our uh, food resources are scarce, our body has uh, a motivation to look who is working bad to proceed with it, to eliminate it. Uh, and some other approaches are uh, gypoxic trainings. So we uh, have a low level of oxygen. So actually, um, it's uh, any stress, low level stress, which can increase our body motivation to, uh, to improve quality control system may help with it. And of course, there are several compounds which can increase mitophagy, like spermidine, um, et, et cetera. Uh, thank you so much. So the next one will be about onto antioxidants. It is known that antioxidants have a positive effect on mitochondria. What is the source of antioxidants? Where do they get them from? Where do we get yes. them from? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Thank you for the question. The story with antioxidants is not that simple, actually. Uh, yes, indeed, the mitochondria are the main source for reactive oxygen species in our body because they deal with electrons to give us energy and there is always oxygen with oxidized molecules. And if something goes wrong, we have this reactive oxygen species. And the bad from reactive oxygen species that these molecules um, can damage our good molecules. They can damage our fats, membranes, for example, they can damage our DNA, leading to mutations, etc. Uh, and in 1960s, I believe free radical theory of aging was very popular. Like uh, we age because we accumulate this reactive oxygen species, which damage everything and mitochondria. And if we eliminate them, we can live longer forever. I don't know. But the thing is, reactive oxygen species are signaling molecules. And um, they tell, first of all, they tell our body that something is wrong and we have to deal with it. And actually, uh, we can compare it to a temperature of our body. For example, when you got a cold or a virus, like when it's not too high, it's healthy and we do not have to do anything with it because it stimulates our immunity our protective systems to deal with virus, for example. And when it is too high, it can damage molecules and we take aspirin, antipyretic drugs, etc. The same stuff is with reactive oxygen species. Like when our body uh, is good enough and it's young and it has resources, reactive oxygen species stimulate adaptive response. And it's good because our cells, our nucleus, see that something is wrong with mitochondria. But when it became too high and our own systems can't deal with it, it can lead to a harmful, harmful stuff. And that's why probably antioxidants didn't yet become something that cure aging at all. So it, it works, but for specific, but only for specific uh, indications. And another stuff, antioxidants, they can be very different. The most potent antioxidants are our own antioxidant system, like glutathione system. Everyone have heard about it. And uh, 
the best we can do with antioxidants, we have to provide everything so our own antioxidant system can work appropriately. For example, for glutathione system, we need B vitamins, zinc, selenium, sometimes n acetylcysteine so glutathione can be synthesized. Um, melatonin we have already talked about and some compounds like ellagic acid, sulforaphane, etc. also supports our own antioxidant system. And also there are compounds that can itself neutralize free radicals like C and E vitamins, E vitamins, but they can never be compared to our own antioxidant system and can provide just additional help with dealing with oxidative stress. So I would say that the perfect antioxidant don't yet exist except our own systems. So the, the first step we have to do is provide everything so it can work appropriately. The second one is to care about mitochondria function so it does not generate too many reactive oxygen species. And the third thing maybe add some more antioxidants in our with our food and then thinking about supplements like in that in that direction. Thank you so much. That is very important to hear, I think, for our audience. The next one uh, question is, are dietary supplements more of a marketing ploy or do they really boost mitochondria? If so, which ones should we take? Well, I would say both. Uh, unfortunately, we still don't have a universal remedy of panacea for improving mitochondrial function. And that, that, that's sad, of course. But supplements still can be very useful when they are personalized. For example, if you have, have some deficits uh, with your, I don't know, metabolic pathways, supplements can easily and uh, fast replenish it and improve mitochondrial function. From uh, recent supplements for mitochondria improving, uh, actually we are very optimistic um, about relatin A. It's a postbiotic, so it is uh, naturally generated from our gut bacteria from specific food components like lagitanins, pomegranates, uh, red grapes, etc. When we eat it and when we have appropriate microbiota, uh, it makes us relatin A. It's an organic compound and it has an ability to improve mitochondria function and which is more important to stimulate metophagy process. So to stimulate a quality control system, which is important while aging. And now some supplements with relatin A are available. So if you don't have appropriate microbiota, you can still take this compound, for example. And uh, there is a clinical trials and first results on elderly patients showed that relatin A has an ability uh, to improve muscle functions, endurance parameters in elderly group without any other interventions except relatin A. So it's kind of a good results for supple mitochondria supplements. So, and, but anyway, we can go with something more natural. For example, mitochondria is our, in our brain is very important for our cognitive process, etc. And it was shown that serotonin mm -hmm. has an ability to improve their function. So if we make ourselves happy, and it also can improve our mitochondria function. For sure. Thank you. Olga, uh, which habits should be eliminated and which foods should be excluded from the diet to preserve mitochondrial function? Well, it's also kind of a broad topic. Uh, we already mentioned that having breaks, breaks in our food uh, are important, at least night break. And it's better if our health allow us to have like five hours at least break between foods. Uh, also, what is very important, fats. Fats affect mitochondria a lot. For example, we have different fats and different fatty acids. And from fatty acids, linoleic fatty acid is important for mitochondrial membranes, and we definitely have to have it in our diet. 
Uh, then the stearic acid, it contained it, uh, cacao bones, like in chocolate, for example. It's also good for mitochondrial function because it stimulates the dynamics. So a little bit of chocolate is also good for mitochondria. Uh, but, for example, palmitic acid, like in palm oil, can be damaging for mitochondria because they have special transporter for it and it can affect oxidizing of other stuff. So they can prioritize it. Too much sugar is bad for mitochondria, as we already discussed. And uh, on mice experiments, it was shown that fructose was worse than glucose, for example, from sugars. Uh, what else should we mention? Having enough trace elements, zinc, selenium, magnesium. Magnesium is very important for mitochondria function because uh, our ATP, our energy molecule, works just in comp complex with magnesium. So don't forget to add this into the diet. Uh, some compounds can also stimulate like short-term short -term mitochondria when they do not overconsume them, like uh, coffee, for example, it also can be good, but like in a limited in a limited quantity. Thank you. That was very interesting. And actually, we do have uh, the last question for you for today. Okay. Interview. Um, but it's a common one. What is the current stage of mitochondrial therapy in the world? Which country is the leader in this direction? Are scientific breakthroughs in this direction being made now? Well, yes, I would say yes. Indeed, last, I think, five years, there were a lot of scientific stuff made, uh, which give us promise that uh, we will be able to, like, radically improve mitochondria functions. And I would mention several approaches for it. Uh, regarding the country leading of, in mitochondria research, I think it's United States, of course, because a lot of startups and biotech companies are localized there, uh, United Kingdom, and I think Israel. There is a very uh, promising company in mitochondria medicine. Uh, and regarding the approaches which are developing now, the first one is mitochondria transplantation. So if we have declined mitochondria function or some rare genetic disorder, for example, we can uh, take donor mitochondria and inject them into our cells or into our tissues, for example, so they can provide enough energy and uh, other stuff so our tissues can work appropriately. And this approach is developing and it was tested on human already. It was tested on... Um, children with specific uh, heart uh, illness. Uh, and they took mitochondria from muscles and injected uh, this mitochondria into a heart muscle so it can function more appropriately. And also, as there is a similar approach, but uh, they use mitochondria from also from donors. So, for example, uh, we can take young mitochondria from placenta. And uh, that is what is doing Israel company, my Novia. But they inject this mitochondria uh, into our own cells. They also work with uh, children with specific mitochondrial diseases. Uh, they inject them into cells uh, taken from bone marrow of this patient. So these patients inherit some uh, rare genetic mutation in mitochondria, so they are not functioning appropriately. But when we inject healthy mitochondria in their own bone marrow cells, these cells can divide, they can provide uh, more healthy immunity, they can give uh, uh, the new start of population of healthy mitochondria because healthy mitochondria can also divide and give new start for mitochondria. And they have really promising results with this mitochondria transplantation technique. And this is one approach which is actively developing and more and more clinical clinical data appearing like every month, I think, for mitochondria transplantation. And another thing is uh, editing of mitochondria genomes because a lot of, of this mitochondria dysfunction is connected um, to mitochondrial DNA mutations. It's inherited diseases. And also when we age, uh, our mitochondria 
they have specific uh, mutation in the DNA and it, uh, more and more mitochondria are getting it. We don't know for sure why this specific mutation, like common dilation, it hold, um, like while, while spreading during aging. But anyway, this approach to uh, aided mitochondrial genome is very interesting. And before we didn't have um, any opportunity to edit it, even so we could edit and nuclear genome, and we know some good results we have already obtained for rare diseases. For mitochondria, it was more complicated because of organization of mitochondrial genetic material. But recently, it was found that some uh, some stuff we can take from bacteria, some bacterial enzymes, has the ability to help us to edit mitochondrial genomes. And if it works, uh, it, if it works, it also gives a great promise both for aging and for inherited mitochondrial diseases. And the third group of approaches, I would say uh, they are like physical, biophysical approaches. We can influence mitochondrial functions through laser therapy, through uh, magnetic field, etc. And when we adjust it appropriately with the wavelengths and intensity, etc., we can stimulate both mitophagy or formation of new mitochondria, improving of its function. And it's also a good approach. So we can do it for brain and for blood, etc. And I would say these three directions are the most promising now. And we are all expecting for the new results. Thank you, Olga. You know, that was such an interesting and amazing scientific interview, not only for scientists, but for everybody. I mean, for the, all the audience that wants to improve their health, who wants to know more about uh, mitochondria. And we are very glad to have you. Thank you so much for your wonderful Thank you. It's a pleasure. And actually, we are very happy to see you. Again, one more time with the new topics, with the new interview. I'm wishing you to have a wonderful day and best regards. We'll get back to you. Okay, thank you very much.